And I want to talk to you today about into the troubled. Into the troubled, John 5. And uh, you mind if I read a few verses of Scripture here this morning? John 5, 1, after this there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. And now there is at Jerusalem by the sheep market a pool, which is called in the Hebrew tongue Bethesda, having five porches. And these lay a great multitude of impotent folk, of blind, halt, withered, waiting, waiting for the moving of the water. For an angel went down at a certain season into the pool and troubled the water, and whosoever then first, after the troubling of the water, stepped in, was made whole of whatsoever disease he had. And a certain man was there which had an infirmity thirty and eight years, and when Jesus saw him lie, and knew that he had been now a long time in that case, he saith unto him, Wilt thou be made whole? The impotent man answered him, Sir, I have no man. See, Jesus didn't ask him for an excuse. He didn't ask him for an excuse. He just asked him, Do you want to be made whole? And here's the man's excuses I have no man when the water is troubled to put me into the pool, but while I am coming, another steppeth down before me. And Jesus saith unto him, Rise, take up thy bed, and walk. And immediately the man was made whole, and took up his bed, and walked. And on the same day was the Sabbath. Everybody say Sabbath. The Jews therefore said unto him that was cured, It is the Sabbath day. It is not lawful for thee to carry thy bed. He answered them, He that made me whole, the same said unto me, Take up thy bed and walk. And then asked they him, What man is it that which said unto thee, Take up thy bed and walk? And he that was healed was not who it was, for Jesus had conveyed himself away. A multitude in that, being in a multitude in that place, and afterward Jesus findeth him in the temple, said unto him, Behold, thou art made whole. Sin no more. That's the worst thing come unto thee. The man departed and told the Jews that it was Jesus which had made him whole, and therefore did the Jews persecute Jesus. Man, you'd think they would celebrate it. But no. They wanted to persecute him. They sought to slay him because he had done these things on the, and everybody said, Sabbath day. Amen. How many know the story? Now, I said, I'm going to ease into it. I don't mean go into a long winter nap. Amen. <laughs> Maybe we ought to move pews or something. I don't know. You ever, you ever been to one of those services? I've seen churches almost split over somebody asking them to change sides. <laughs> I was preaching a revival in southeast Missouri back about 100 years ago. And uh, I was just, man, we, it was just locked up. We couldn't get a break. We just couldn't get you know, it just, I mean, I was praying and preaching. And so I walked to the pulpit that day. I was getting ready to read my text. And I just got a little inspiration. I said, you know what? There's only two sections of pews. So I said, I want everybody on this side, if you don't mind to move over on this side. And I want everybody on this side to move over on this side. Well, you're going to find out that a lot of churches are family owned and operated. <laughs> and a lot of people bought their pew. Yeah. <laughs> they take a little ownership of things. Uh, boy, I could tell you some more stories about that kind of stuff. Amen. I had a musician play the organ, put a padlock on it. Because we had brought somebody in to do some training, and they were going to play it, and she put a padlock on it so nobody else could get to it. And, and uh, this was in my first year of pastoring, and trust me, it wasn't a good year. <laughs> so they called me and said, there's a padlock on the organ. And I said, there's a what? Yeah, there's a padlock on it. So a little, little discernment take over, and I called the lady that normally played it, and I asked her, I said, you put a padlock on that? She said, I did. I said, well, why don't you put it on there? She said, because that's my organ. I said, that's your organ? She said, yeah. I said, did you pay for it? She said, well, no, I didn't, but I'm, I'm the one that plays it. And I said, you were the one that played it. 
And I'm not a good pastor. That's not the way to handle it. I should have been a little more compassionate and diplomatic. And, and she said, well, I'm not going to unlock it. I said, that's fine. I got a hammer. Anyway, so back to the story that I originally was telling you about asking people to change sides. Uh, I, I, you know, I, um, I asked that, and so everybody started switching sides, except right down the second pew with this good sisters right here. And a uh, little lady sitting there, little large lady sitting there, <laughs> little large, I was trying to be kind to her. And uh, I looked down, she's still sitting there, and I said, I'm asking everybody, if you just switch sides, and she looked at me and she said, I'm not moving. I was like, wow. Mm. Now, this was before I went to pastoring. <laughs> and I used to have a real quick trigger finger. And uh, I said, no, I'm going to ask you to move. She said, I told you I'm not moving. And all I could think of is the headlines of the local paper the next day. <laughs> Pentecostal preacher goes crazy and kills old lady in the church service. <laughs> well, you'd be surprised how we can get in a little comfort zone and a little place of security. Mm. And uh, making changes is not comfortable. The older I get, the less I like change. It's just not comfortable. Well, they all did it except her, and then finally the Lord prevailed and moved on me to show a little mercy. And, and I'm telling you, it was the craziest thing because I went to read my text when I did. It's like somebody threw a bomb in that place. It exploded in worship and praise and before it was over that next week, I think we had 20-something people get the Holy Ghost. And it was a church that hadn't prayed anybody through in years. You see, God knows how we can kind of get into a, what we want to make a permanent place. We want to make it a permanent place. And uh, I, I think that a lot of us are kind of maybe under this false illusion that if we can just wait it out a little longer, things will go back to pre-COVID. And even the political scene will change and go back to pre-COVID. And uh, the problem with me is once I get somewhere, I want to make it permanent. But one of the things you have to learn about God is, is that God is always taking you from something to something. We go from glory to glory. It's always a process. Now, a lot of us, well, I'll say me, we get to one place of glory and we want to make it a permanent place because realistically, after you've been there for a while, it becomes a security to you. you. It's predictable. You feel safe there. And uh, let, me, let me, can I borrow you, buddy, right here? Yeah, yeah, either one of you. Either one of you. Now, I want you to stand right there, okay? Just stand. No, no, right, yeah, right there. Just stand right there, okay? What's your name? Daniel? I'm not going to put you in the lion's den. I promise you that. Amen. <laughs> okay, Daniel, here's the deal. See, you're in this place here, and... Your feet are level. So you feel secure in your ability to stabilize yourself <clears throat> and to properly stand. See, this is where we all like to stop, but we can't. So what happens is, is God says, okay, I need you to take another step. Now, here's the deal. The psalmist said, my feet stand in an even place. It's a military term because the first thing they taught you in the military then was keep your feet level. If one foot got above another, you were out of balance and it was easier to knock you over and they could breach the line. So what he's saying to us is, the psalmist was saying is, is 
be balanced in your life and all. But the problem with that is, is when God calls us because every, it's an ascension. Glory to glory goes from this level of glory, I call it the glory road, to the next level of glory. But it's like Jacob's ladder. Jacob's ladder was not a construction ladder. It was actually a staircase. And we actually, I don't, no, never mind, I'm getting into that. We take an ascent up that step. Now, here's the problem. Are you ready? The moment that you decide to pick that right foot of yours up, hold, now you're vulnerable. It's easy to knock you over. Now, I could have pushed you over a while ago. I could have just fell on you and you'd have knocked over. But, <laughs> <laughs> but now it's easy for me to knock you over. And I will tell you, that transitions and ascending into different places, there's a time in that that you feel very vulnerable because you're stepping out of that area of comfort that you've been in. I'm talking to you here today. You're stepping out of that area of comfort, which is predictable, and your feet are stable, and, and you can stand there. And so we all have a tendency, let's just camp here, and let's just make this permanent because this is a good place for us to stop. And I think especially in America, we wanted to stop pre-COVID. We had a strong economy. We had a seemingly president that was pro-Israel, pro-church, and all that stuff and on. So a lot of us just kind of, and then all of a sudden, things become troubled. Whew. And God's saying, I, I, I really, I have to trouble where you're at so I can get you to where I need you to go. I ought to be able just to speak to you and you hear me, but the problem is in your humanity, you like the security of where you're standing, and I'm going to have to do something to get you from there to the next place. There's another thing that's going to happen. You ready? So when you pick that right foot up, not only are you out of balance and unstable, but now you're fighting natural law. You know what it's called? It's called the law of gravity. Now, as long as you put your foot back down, as long as you're just standing there, you're okay. Muscles are kind of relaxed. I mean, it's taking a few to stand there. But the moment you pick that foot up and go, now there's natural resistance against you, which means muscles are going to have to kick in that you don't have to have kick in when you're standing. And so it's going to require something. So there's two things that happen when the churches and 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 organizations and people are in a spiritual transition is first of all you feel vulnerable because that safe place that you wanted to make permanent see david went to the prophet and said i want to build god a house and nathan said go ahead build him a house then he gets home and god said i didn't tell you to tell him that go back and tell him this and so he went back to david and said when did god ever ask anybody to build him a house he said, God has always gone from tabernacle to tabernacle and from tent to tent, meaning, meaning he's a moving God. Now, you want to create something that's permanent to put him in. But he's a God of movement. Mm. He, 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 he's a God of movement. And so we, we want to make certain places permanent. We want to capture. Oh, you, you, you can sit down. I, 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 I'm really off right now. I'm just kind of. You know, a lot of people want to make certain seasons in their life permanent. Can, can I just help you with something? Can I help you with something? If you're 70, quit trying to look like you're 20. <laughs> I hate to tell you, but your 20s is not permanent. <laughs> And I see people that don't understand the season that they're living in, and they're frustrated because they're trying to make an old season or an old place or an old thing permanent, and God says, there's nothing permanent until I get you to glorification. There's nothing permanent. Mm. Now, now, I'm telling you, I hate transitions. I've never been through a transition that was fun. God said, okay, I want you to go here. Oh, yeah, let's, you know. Mine are always a little tumultuous, a little rocky. Does anybody relate to what I'm talking about right now? Amen. And uh, so now the story. You know the story. A certain season, an angel goes down and he troubles 
One says he moved the waters. But down a few verses later, it said he troubled the waters. That, that means to, um, it'd be like take, it's not like he just, kind of like you stick your finger in water and just kind of turn around and see what the temperature is. It means it's kind of like it's slapping it. And it's being troubled. And, uh, and the word troubled, uh, of course, that connotation, and then the other would be, it starts violating your inner tranquility. It's trying to make you anxious, being troubled. You ever, have you ever heard somebody say, boy, they're a troubled soul? That, that's kind of what I'm talking about. So, but watch this. It wasn't the devil that troubled the waters. It was an angel that troubled the waters. Ooh. I mean, they're all in there and the waters are peaceful and calm. And then the next thing you know, man, it's just like a, I, I don't want to use the word tsunami, but it's, it's just really troubled. And the first one into that trouble, the first one into it got a miracle. Mm. Now, <clears throat> I know what you're saying. You know, Jesus comes on the scene there. Of course, we could go into all the stuff, you know, Bethesda, House of Mercy, water, whatever. We go into all that. But the deal is, is Jesus comes to that pool, and he sees this man that had been laying there for 38 years, and he walks up to him and says, uh, how long have you been laying here? Well, I've been here about 38 years. You know, like he's telling God how long he's been there, you know, informing him. And so <laughs> I've been here 38 years. And he said, well... You, you, you want to be made whole? And this guy says, oh, man. Because, see, he's associating the troubling of the waters. They're not troubled. They're not troubled. So, so I'm going to give you my excuse. There's no man will help me. When the waters are troubled, I try. But there's no man to help me. So this is my excuse. And Jesus said, I'm not really looking for an excuse. I ask you a simple question. Wilt thou be made whole? See, this man is trying to figure out the waters aren't troubled. And so I know a lot of you are looking at my message right now and saying, okay, that's a valid point. The waters aren't troubled, so your message is about into the trouble. So the man didn't enter into the troubled waters. No, he didn't enter into the troubled waters, but he did enter into the troubled I don't understand what you mean. Let me help you with that. Jesus is about to trouble the religious system. He's about to do a miracle on the Sabbath. That's a no-no. He heals him on the Sabbath and tells him, take up thy bed and walk. <laughs> he does it, man, he's happy, he's rejoicing. The Jews hear about it. They brought him in for a little questioning. I mean, you can't carry your bed on the Sabbath, but you can bring somebody in for questioning. Amen. And so he, they bring him in, and they say, inconsistencies. Amen. And they bring him in. They said, I don't even know who did it, man. I'm just excited. I mean, for 38 years, I've been laying over here, and I've been made, oh, isn't this wonderful? And they said, no, it's not wonderful. He's, You're not supposed to carry your bed on the Sabbath. So right there it is. Jesus just troubled the Sabbath because what they didn't understand is, is that Jesus is Lord of the Sabbath. <laughs> Jesus was Lord of the Sabbath. And he has, as God, he has a right to trouble the Sabbath, and that's exactly what he did. And so he troubled it. And when the man entered into the troubled, ooh, he, he got his miracle. Mm. You got it. See, there's, there's, yeah, this is the part we're not going to like. There's seasons of troubling. Now, the angel comes first and troubles the waters, but Jesus comes next and troubles the religious system and troubles the Sabbath. And so there's seasons of it. And we're going to have to understand there are seasons of things being troubled. Now, when we view what's being troubled, we have a tendency, like I said a while ago, using Daniel, a while ago, we have a tendency to not want to enter into the troubled. 
We want to back away from it. We want to go around it. We want to wait until it's not troubled anymore and everything goes back to tranquility. But the problem with that is it's only those that go into the troubled that gets the miracle. Mm. Let's, let's praise him here just a second. Let's praise him here a second. And there's a, there's a lot of Bible stories I could give you. I mean, a lot of Bible stories. I could talk to you about uh, Paul and Timothy. Timothy become troubled. He become troubled with fear. That's exactly what the word troubled means. He becomes troubled with fear. And so Paul writes to him and says, God didn't give that to you. But you're not going to defeat it by trying to run from it. And you're not going to defeat it and get a miracle over it by trying to go around it. But the way that you will beat it is you need to stir up that gift that's within you and you need to enter into the very thing that's trying to torment you and bring fear into you. So the church needs to quit trying to run around what's troubling and, ru- and try to get around it or just kind of wait it out. And well, if we wait long enough, the pandemic's going to pass. No, God's not asking the church just stay still. God's asking the church, I need you to move into what's troubled right now because that's where the miracles are going to happen. You don't think, and I know I'm preaching you stuff that that you already know, but you don't think when Jesus told those boys on that, he said, go to the other side, I'll meet you over there. And I mean, you'd think that he didn't know there was a storm coming? He sent his disciples into the troubled. Why did he send them into the troubled? So they could witness a miracle. What in the world do you think happened when Jesus comes walking on the waters? And I mean, the waves are tumultuous. The, the, the sea is troubled. And then Jesus comes walking and Peter said, is it you, Lord? He said, yeah, it's really me. He said, if it's really you, bid me come. Okay, Peter, if you really want the miracle, you're going to have to get out of that boat and step right into the troubled. And if you'll step right, oh, I know, eh, he was sinking. Let, let me help you with that one. You don't just start to sink, you sink. I think he may begin to descend, but the fact is he's still got a miracle that's taking place, but he got in trouble when he got his eyes off of the miracle worker and the provider and the source of the miracle, and he started looking around at what was troubled. I'm telling you here today, the church needs to get its eyes off of what's troubling and get our eyes on the miracle worker because God is inviting the church into the troubled. Oh, praise God. Mm -hmm. Everything's peaceful. Everything's calm. The waters are calm. And then... We like that calm, peaceful. And I'm going to tell you here a while back, I, I, I mean, when COVID started, we lived in the wonderful state of California, and I decided I'm going to buy me a, a boat. So I went and bought this boat. And then they started shutting the lakes down. They did. Can't even go to the lake. I guess you're going to get COVID all in the water. I don't know. Amen. Amen. <laughs> So we bought this boat, and then they finally opened up a lake. And I like to fish, and especially crappie fish. And so uh, I took John Mark and Jeremy and Jude, my grandson, and another preacher in the area, and got us on this boat. And we went up to a place called Clear Lake. Clear Lake is a probably, uh, I think it's the number one top-rated bass lake in the country. It really is. And so they told us, man, the crappie are biting up there. And crappie fishing there. Is this okay if I talk about fishing? Y'all feel comfortable with that here in Louisiana? <laughs> and uh, so we decided to go up. Now, the problem with Clear Lake is it's deep, and it's, it's a large lake. And it can, it can, I mean, the wind can pick up, and it can turn just like that. So we checked the weather. We get up there, and we're all on this boat. And so I should have picked up on it, Pastor Gentry, when we pulled up at the boat dock, and there's 
no other people out there. But my gift was not working that day, amen. And so we take off, and there's, there's one boat in the little cove, and then we get out on the lake, and I'm telling you, it was rough. But we're going to get down to that place where the crop bear biting. And so, man, we turned it, and the way to get there, the waves are crashing over the back of the boat into the boat. And that's when the bilge pump decided to go out. So I'm kind of driving the boat. It's kind of a bigger boat. And so I'm going to drive it standing there. And uh, somebody tapped me on the shoulder, and I said, yeah. And they said, is this normal? <laughs> and I turned around. There's about that much water back there in the boat. And I said, no, it's not normal. And uh, something's wrong. And so we start. Now, I'm telling you, I started to panic a little bit. Because I got my grandson out there, and you know, and I'm just like, oh, this is not good. And then, you know, it's going to be tough swimming in this. <laughs> so I'm trying to figure it out and trying to get over it. I mean, brother, it's, it's, getting, it's getting bad. And so we finally got off into a cove and got it, the boat turned around, and we jumped out of the boat and led it over to a little area and got the water out of it and finally fixed the bilge pump. And, and they said, you still want to go on down there? I said, no, no, I don't have any desire to fish now. I can tell you that right now. <laughs> I'm going to tell you, the, the, the trouble is not, it's not a good place to be. There's a lot of fear that comes when you're in the trouble because it's, it's kind of unpredictable. Whew. You still with me here? It's kind of unpredictable. Now, here's what I want to tell you. If you look at the future, things are troubled. And I'm going to tell you, it's not going to stop. Um, here's what I see. This is what I see in the spirit. I see us a lot like Egypt. And I see Moses going into the court of Pharaoh telling him, let God's people go. And Pharaoh saying, who is the Lord that I should obey his voice? I don't know him. In any nation or society that starts spouting that off has the same spirit that got a hold of Pharaoh. It goes all the way back to the original lie. Who is the Lord that I should obey his voice? And this is exactly where America has come to and our world has come to, it's come to this deal. We don't have to live like that. We don't have to do that. Who gives you the right to tell us how to live? Well, I'm not the one trying to tell you. The Bible's trying to tell you. I don't know that Bible. I don't know that God. I'm not going to do that. Because basically, the original lie was to convince Eve and Adam that they could be like God. And that's the spirit of Pharaoh. He was a God. And I'm going to tell you, the biggest God that we all fight, you listen to me, the biggest God in America that we all fight, and I could talk about a lot of gods, but the biggest one is self. We make ourselves a God. I don't want to do that. I'll just do this. And then the spirit of iniquity gets a hold of you, which is not just lawlessness. It's you, I don't like those laws, so I'll rewrite it, and I'll make it my own law. And this is exactly where... America's at and other nations are at and it could even creep into the church. I don't have to live like that. I don't have to obey the scripture. I don't have to do what it says. You're not going to tell me, Pastor, you're not going to teach anything to me and tell me how I have to live. I don't have to, boy, it got quiet. Amen. I don't have to do that. I'll live the way that I want to live. I'll let society tell me how to live. I won't let the scripture tell me how to live, but I'll let society tell me how to live. I'll choose what I'm going to do. And the moment that that spirit consumes a nation or a people, you just get ready. Because that nation is headed for trouble. And Moses steps, well, I feel the Holy Ghost right now. And Moses steps on the scene and says, you need to let God's people go. Now, if you know anything about it, and I'm not here to teach you a Sunday school lesson, but the fact is, the 10 plagues, the number 10 is completion. And so God says, I'm going to completely plague you. 
And if you study those 10 plagues, I ain't got time again, they directly are about 10 deities of the Egyptians. And the first three plagues, the Hebrews were not exempt from it because the first three plagues is destroying the religious system of Egypt. And God says, I'm going to prove to Egypt who I am, and I'm going to prove to you Hebrew people who I am. So you're going to go through the same thing they're going to go through for the first three plagues. And I'm telling you, when God decides to teach America that he's still God, he does not exempt the church from the plagues. Are you listening to me here today? God wants the world to know it, and he wants to remind his people to know it. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is. I don't know any other gods. Now, you're not going to like what I'm about to say, but we got gods in the church. Not one God, we got gods in the church. Boy, you don't want me going there right now. There'll be a time when men will be lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. You can make pleasure a God. Well, how do I make it a God? When you give your money to it and you give your energy and time to it more than you do to God, you've made whatever it is a God. I want to say it again. When you give more money to that and more time to that and more of your emotional attachment to that than you do to God, you've just made yourself a God. And then you wonder why all of a sudden all hell's breaking loose in the world and in the church and God's trying to get our attention and say, I need you to get back to one fact. There ain't any other gods out here except me, and I need you to worship me with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. That's what God's asking the church to do right now. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I ain't getting into that. The next plagues. First three deal with the religious system. The next plagues, you ready for it? Their economy. Cattle, crops. He said, I'm going to plague your economy. Now here, now Pastor, we start talking about some of this stuff and all. Pentecost people are like, oh my God, oh my, don't, don't say that. I mean, I woke up this morning, I knew what God dealt me in. I was trying to pray a little bit, and I'm going back. We're trying to buy a little place out in the hills and the mountains a little bit. And, and I was like, oh my God, you know, should I do this or should I not do it? And I mean, you know, what if I do this? And then the economy collapses like everybody's predicting and all. And I'm just kind of like, but watch this. You got, you got all these famines and you got all this stuff coming. You got darkness. But it didn't happen in Goshen. It didn't happen among the Hebrew people. One God covenant people. It didn't go that way. God spared their cattle. It's dark over here. There's no locust. There's light. And so God's saying, I'm going to totally destroy the economical system of the Egyptians. Hmm. Boy, I'm going to go a step further with that. When Pharaoh finally decided to let them go, initially, it's a little compromise. You can go, but leave your cattle with us. Cattle was their wealth. You can go, but leave your cattle with us. In other words, you can go out there and worship, but leave your resources in the Egyptian system. Don't take your finances and offer it as a sacrifice. Leave it here with us. It's in there. Moses said, oh no, we're not gonna do that. We're not gonna do that. We're, we're gonna take our cattle with us. And now we're gonna take our cattle with us. But whatever wealth you got left, we're gonna take it too. And they did. They spoiled them. So the first thing is the religious system collapses. It's plague. The next thing is the economical system. The fourth thing that comes around is, is the physical. Boils and stuff starts happening. And God's dealing with, and then ultimately death. So God's even going to teach them, your body's not God. 
Oh, that really went over. No. Watch how he's done. It's systematic. And if you study it, one plague naturally leads to the next plague. Naturally it does. If this happens, then naturally this is going to happen. And God's proven to them, I'm controlling nature. I can use nature. Ooh. The Lord opened my eyes something here. I, I got I to hurry and stop. The Lord opened my eyes something here the other day. You know, we always talk about he's the Lord of the host. So I always thought that's angels. And then all of a sudden, this tending, God showed me, no, it didn't just stop with angels. It stops with create. It, it includes creation. It includes all the way down to the atoms. So God says, I'll tell you what my army includes. Yeah, it includes angels, but it also includes creation, even down to the atoms. And that's why, who was a Sisera, the stars in their place, and the river Kidron or whatever fought against you? God said, that's also a part of my army. The insect world's a part of my army. Oh, boy, it is really kind of weird right now. Amen. He said, the caterpillar, the palm worm, and the canker worm. He said, that was my great army that I sent among you. God says, all of this is my army. All of this is for me. And I can use whatever I want to use to trouble, to trouble what I need to trouble. But to those that's trying to go around it and not identify, you know, I, I was talking to my wife the other day. I said, my God, when are Californians going to wake up? No, seriously, when are we going to wake up? We got COVID. We got all these fires. You wouldn't believe the devastation. Of course, to me, it's nature's way of cleaning itself. But here's the deal. It's just, we got all this stuff that just keeps coming. And I mean, man, they're just raising taxes and companies are leaving. And people are, I think, 120,000 people a month is leaving the state of California. And they're headed to Louisiana. And <laughs> Just welcome them with open arms, folks. Enjoy them. <laughs> and they're headed to Texas, and they're headed to Colorado. I mean, they're just like, we're tired of all this stuff and all. And I asked them, well, I said, when will Californians wake up? But the problem is, is Pharaoh's heart becomes hardened. Because he's so stinking arrogant, so full of pride, his heart becomes hardened. And this is exactly the system that you're going to watch. Instead of this stuff waking us up, and they said, oh, my God, we're tired of these plagues. They just keep hardening their hearts until God says, I'm really, now, now I'm not quite done yet. Watch this. So now the body, there's another one. The last one, you know what it is? God destroyed the whole Egyptian military. And so when God decides to plague a nation, you just get ready. He's going to touch the religion of it. He's going to touch the, econo the economy. He's going to touch the body. He's going to touch the military. And that does not mean America is exempt. Doesn't mean we're exempt. I'm about done. A few years ago, God spoke something very clearly to me. It was so profound, so clearly. Matter of fact, God spoke to me about some things that I would be involved in, some things I'd be used in. And it was so far out there. And I was just kind of like, oh, God, you got to be kidding. I, I, you, me? you got to be joking. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I know where I'm from. That, that, that's just way too far out there. And uh, so the Lord, that day in prayer, he said, okay, to prove to you that this is from me, I'm going to let you know that I'm going to visit this area not many days hence with massive death and destruction. And so... I was like, oh. And he said, but you remember in that day that when Pharaoh, when Moses was standing before Pharaoh, Moses was not in the court of Pharaoh. Pharaoh was in my court. When Moses walked in to speak for God, the whole scenario changes. He wasn't standing in Pharaoh's court. God had brought Pharaoh into his court. And we're dealing now with an Egyptian system. But just as much as God raised up Moses then, he will raise up some Moseses in the end time that are going to address. Now, I want you to tell me. Now, we talk, you'll talk about fivefold ministry just a second. We talk about prophets. Okay, let me just be honest with you. I see most of our prophets only operating in the church. 
But I'm going to tell you what God's getting ready to do. God's getting ready to bring up and raise up some prophets that are not going to just speak to the church and the body, but they're going to speak to kings and they're going to speak to nations. And this thing is about to be elevated and the whole thing is about to be troubled and the world's being troubled right now and it's going to continue to be troubled. But the people of God understand we're not running from that trouble. We're headed right into that trouble because... While there's darkness in Egypt, there'll be light in Goshen. While your cattle are dying, ours are going to be spared because that's what we're going to sacrifice with. And our crops are not going to be destroyed. Woo! If we're not careful, we're going to look at the future and become fearful and say, oh, my God, what's going to happen next? Can I just be honest with you? I don't know what's going to happen next. Well, I think some of these things. But it's not for us to be troubled. Let not your hearts be troubled. I'll trouble what needs to be troubled. But don't let that trouble trouble your heart. If you believe. <laughs> Ooh. The Holy Ghost is trying to speak to the church. And it's trying to tell us, yes, the times are troubled. And yes, there's some things coming now. But don't let your hearts be troubled. If you will move into what's being troubled, this is where you will see a release of the miraculous power of God, unprecedented. Are you listening to me? And it's not the stock market, it's not Dow Jones, it's not the economy. That's not your source. And my God shall supply all of your need according to his riches and glory. So while he's troubling and plaguing out here, don't let your hearts be troubled because the psalmist said, I'm young, I was young and now I'm old, but I've never seen the righteous forsaken or his seed begging bread. And so the church needs to have a peace in their heart and understand God may send you to the brook, but he'll do a miracle by sending a raven to feed you, or he'll create a whittle over here that it never runs dry. I'm prophesying to you here today, yes, things are troubled, but the church is not going to run around the trouble, try to wake the trouble out. The church is going to move right into the troubled, and when we get into the troubled, we are going to see miracles like the book of Acts seen, and I think even greater than the book of Acts seen. So I don't know what's troubling you here today. I don't know if your family's troubled, your finances are troubled, your health's troubled. I don't know what's troubled in your life here today, but I'm, I'm, I'm asking you not just to sit and wait. Okay, I'm just going to try to survive this. I'm asking you today, like Simon Peter, you know what? It is trouble, but I'm about to take a step of faith and step right into the middle of it. And you know what? Sink or swim. I'm not standing in the boat with everybody else just waiting for it to calm down. Woo! So I don't know what you're troubled about. I don't know what you're troubled about. Can I just, I, 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 just, just stand, stand. I don't know what you're troubled about. You see, God, God operates by what I call the contrast of revelation. Okay? In other words, whatever it is that he's ultimately trying to show you he has to bring the opposite first. You would have no comprehension of light unless there had been darkness first. You wouldn't even know what morning is unless night come first. That's God's creative order. Not morning, then evening. He, God's creative order always starts with an evening experience because you'll never understand what I'm about to show you in light and know the value of it unless I take you through the darkness first. Ooh. Case in point. You know, we're praying, God, reveal yourself to me. Here's a better one. Show us your glory. <laughs> you sure you won't see it? Because glory is the invisible being made visible. I, I've been telling churches all over, we're either going to be a word church or a glory church. You can come hear about it and just hear about it and hear about it. But glory is when 
the invisible or the word is made visible. So in other words, we can preach about miracles or we can see them. We can preach about deliverance or we can see them. When you see it, that's God's glory. Creation is God's glory. Here's the deal. So let me give you a good example. I, I just want God, can I tell you one quick personal story? We had an old prophet come through when I was pastor in Oklahoma. And man, he'd get up, he'd prophesy stuff. He, he, <laughs> he'd talk about, you know, he'd be broke and he'd go to his closet and he'd put his hand in his pockets and he'd pull out $100 bills. He said, I knew they wasn't in there when I hung it up. And he started telling all these stories about God's provisions. I mean, and I believed them. I, I mean, I, I believe they were true. And I mean, I was like, wow. And then he turned around one time and he prophesied to my wife and I. He said, he said, Brother Sister Morgan, he said, I see a vault above you opening and I see finances flowing into your life. And Sister Morgan, I see your purse that's full of finances and it's flowing out of your purse. That's why my wife doesn't carry a purse. She carries a little mini suitcase around. Amen. <laughs> She wants to give God a big vault. <laughs> but there's a lot of things about prophecy that's left off. Because the part of the prophecy he left off was vaults open when they fall on you and crush you. <laughs> so crazy me, I get all inspired. Ooh, I want some of those testimonies. If you take test out of testimony, all you got is I money. <laughs> we all want the testimony, but we don't want the test. So God says, I'm going to have to trouble something. And I'm not troubling it just to show you what's troubled. Good case in point. If you're ever going to have the testimony that he's a healer, guess what has to come first? Well, I, 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 now, now I'm not praying. But you know, we're going around praying, well, man, we want to see miracles and all the stuff and all. I get that. But <laughs> we're just asking God to trouble stuff. So here we are. You want to see him as a Jehovah Jireh? You got to be on top of the mountain of sacrifice. You want to see him as a way maker? You got to be surrounded. No way out. This is how God operates. The opposite comes first and all this stuff. So there's a lot of you here today that are troubled and there's some situations in your life. And all it is is God is setting you up for you to go into what's troubled. Man, Pastor, Brother Morgan, my finances are troubled right now through this economy and through, okay, if that's the case, don't, don't lose hope. Say, well, God lied to me. No, just prepare yourself. God's getting ready to do something great in my life. And God's fixing to show me he's the provider. He is Jehovah Jireh. And some of you have been fighting sickness after sickness after sickness, and you've just learned to accept it. Well, just, we're just going to have to accept it. This is just life and the body and all the stuff and all. Well, I get that. I understand the law of nature. But the fact is we also need to come to the point if all this stuff is happening. Ultimately, God's trying to say, just step into it, and I'll, I'll, I'll show you the miracle when you step into it. And so this is where we're at. So I don't know what's troubling you here today. I don't know what's troubling you here today. You, know, you may not feel safe doing this. I don't know what the protocol around here is. But if, if, if you've been troubled about something and you feel comfortable enough that you want to come to the front or you can stay where you're at and we're all going to pray here in just a second, I, I want you to come. Your, your, your health, your family, your finances, your spirit, your soul, your heart is troubled. Your heart is troubled. I'm anxious. I'm anxious. You know, Sister Ming and I had to learn. And a part of that education was I was in revival here. And I was struggling, severely struggling with a panic and anxiety disorder. 
And I tried to figure out every way to go around it. I tried every way to figure it out. But it's like the Lord said, no, I need you to walk right toward what you're fearful of right now. And I don't need it to intimidate you. I need you to go straight into it because it's right there that I'm going to show you the miracle. And I'm going to show you that whatever it is. Can I tell you something in the Holy Ghost right now? I was sitting on the side of my bed. Wow. Suicidal. Begging God to kill me. And when the Lord spoke to me, he said, you need to look at the story of Job. And when he spoke that to me, it's one of the only times in that whole thing he actually spoke something to me personally. And it made me so mad. I said, I know the story of Job. He said, now I want to show you something in the story of Job that you've overlooked. He said, Satan couldn't get to him unless I gave him permission. And I was like, I know that. I, I, I know that. I know that. <laughs> Woo. He said, well, let me ask you another question. Tell me where J Satan went to Job and said, this is what I'm about to do to you. Do you read that in there? I said, no. He said, when I gave him permission to do it, I didn't give him permission to go tell Job what I, he was going to do. I only gave him permission to do it. So whatever it is the enemy is telling you he's going to do means he does not have permission to do it. So if he's telling you he's going to kill you, <clears throat> he doesn't have permission to do it. If he's telling you he's going to destroy <clears throat> your family, your home, your job, whatever, he's letting you know. I don't have permission to do it. If God gives me permission to do it, it would already be done. So that day in that room, I jumped up and started screaming as loud as I could scream. Kill me. If you want to kill me, kill me. Get on in here and do it. Kill me. You want to kill me with a heart attack? Kill me. You want to kill me with cancer? Kill me. Get on in here and do what you said you're going to do. I mean, my wife and them come flying in there. They thought, my God, he actually has flipped right now. And I said, come on, get the job done. You said you were going to do it. Get the job done. And I'm telling you, he was in the room. When he walked into that room, I asked Brooke Payne the other night, I said, let me ask you a question. Or, yeah, I said, if you were in a room with Satan, what do you think you'd feel? So I, I don't know. I said, most people say violence, fear, whatever. I said, No utter hopelessness he is chained in darkness he is a creature without hope and I said so when he comes to you that's exactly what he's trying to chain you in it's where you lose your hope you feel like there's no hope for this situation there's no hope for the pandemic there's no hope for my family don't let him chain you with that. If he's telling you that, then you need to understand he's lying. That's exactly what he's doing. He's lying to you because if God gave him permission to destroy it, he would have already got the job done. So I'm telling some of you here today, you need to get him out of your brain and get him out of your mind and get him out of talking to you and you need to put him under your foot and do like I did. I said, get in here, get the job done or just shut up about doing it. But oh, hey, wait, you can't do it, can you? Woo. It is appointed unto man wants to die. God chooses the instrument of your death. So COVID, if God gives you permission to kill me, there's nothing I can do about it. But don't come in here and brag to me and try to intimidate me and try to make me think you have the power to kill me because you don't unless God gives you permission to do it. I'm trying to help somebody right now with a little faith. I'm trying to help somebody that's been in troubled waters and you're wondering, am I going to sink? No, you're not going to sink. You're going to get out of the boat and step right into the middle of what's troubling you right now. I'm asking the peace of God to come into this room and fill your hearts right now. If you're troubled about something, express it to God. Lift your voice, lift your hands right now. I believe there's some miracles that's going to happen in this building right now. Just start walking toward him. 
just start walking toward him. Everybody else, everybody in your group, everybody in your family may want to stay in the boat. But I'm telling you, take a step of faith here today. Get your eyes on the miraculous. Get your eyes on him. Get it off of the waves, Simon Peter. That's how you'll sink. Keep your eyes fastened on the author and the finisher of your faith right now. Woo. God's getting ready to give you a miracle. God's getting ready to give you a miracle. God's getting ready to give you, it could happen in this altar right now. Before you get home, it could happen. Receive it in the name of Jesus.